Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you again this morning. Now, if you've ever tried to learn a musical instrument, then you know that it takes talent and a good teacher to help you make progress. But more than that, it takes commitment. It's commitment that keeps you practicing long hours. It's commitment that helps you to play that same difficult line again and again until you get it perfect. It's commitment to play your scales and your etudes. It's commitment that makes you work so hard. Commitment is the key ingredient to success with an instrument, and that's exactly what I struggled with for years. See, I, I played the flute for many years. I actually graduated from Wilfrid Laurier with a degree in music performance. But that whole time, I was dogged by this question. Is it worth the commitment? I mean, that I was committed, there's no doubt. I, I logged countless hours in that practice room. But was I committed to something that was worth all the time and energy I was spending on it? See, each one of us must decide what we're going to be committed to in life. Listen, the idea that you can live a life without a commitment is an illusion. Everyone is committed to something, whether that is your job, maybe your family, maybe it's video games, or maybe it's um, leisure. But whatever it is, each one of us has things in our life that we are committed to, whether we like it or not. And the question is, have we chosen well? We don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to commit our time and energy because we only have so much. We don't want to commit it to something that's not worthwhile. What are you committed to? Well, this morning, we're continuing in our sermon series called Ruth, A Redemptive Love Story. And today, we're going to look at a passage and see who and, and, and to what greater cause Ruth was committed. And this is actually one of the most famous statements of commitment, not just in the Bible, but literally anywhere. And this is meant to teach us, don't miss out. Commit yourself to God. That's so important. And my hope is that each one of us this morning are going to reevaluate the things that we are committed to and how much we are committed to the Lord and give ourselves more fully and joyfully to him. Let's start out with prayer. Father, it's good to be here. It's good that we can speak about being committed to you because sinners like us, we have no place talking about this except through the cross. We praise and thank you for the cross of Christ. It is our hope. It is the means of our commitment. And that was all because of your commitment to set your love upon us and redeem us even when we were running from you. And so, Father, help us to dig deeply into the passage this morning. Help us to understand just how committed Ruth was and why and to what. And help us, Lord, to learn from this godly woman of so many years ago and to follow after her and our commitment to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today we're going to examine Ruth chapter 1 again, like I did in the last sermon, but I'm going to try not to be too repetitious. Um, I, I do need to uh, review a little bit, but you'll remember last sermon, we really focused on the story from Naomi's perspective to understand what she was thinking, what she was feeling, and today we're going to focus more on Ruth and Orpah. Now, um, just by way of review. Naomi and her family, they left Israel during a famine, and she, her husband, and her two sons, they moved to Moab. They spent there 10 years. Her daughters, her, her sons got married to daughters-in-law, but then they, they passed away. Her husband passed, her two sons passed, and it left Naomi bereaved with her two daughters-in-law. And when she saw her situation, she decides to go back to her hometown in Israel, and she decides to take the girls with her, but she only takes them halfway. And at that point, she urges them to return to their own country of Moab. She argues that there's no real future for them to follow her to Israel because she's just a penniless aging widow. She can't provide for them. There isn't hope for them. She also argues that her life and the tragedies that she went through prove that God is out to get her. And, and she, basically, she's saying, stay away from me, I'm dangerous. Almost like if someone is calling down lightning upon themselves, you might step back a little bit. She's saying they're going to be safer if they put some distance between themselves and her, because that's the, her situation. Now, 
She also argues that if they return back to Moab and their own country, their own family, they're going to be able to get remarried. They're going to be able to have the children they've been longing for. They're going to be able to have a life again, a life that isn't really waiting for them in Israel. Now, Naomi, I want to focus on this part and draw it out. Naomi actually calls for a double blessing from God upon her two daughters-in-law because she appreciates them so much. She asks God to deal kindly with them and to give them rest in the home of a new husband. Now, to deal kindly with literally means to show the the Hebrew word is hesed, committed, loyal, covenantal love. She wants God to show them that kind of love. And to find rest with a husband is way more than just getting remarried. It means having a joyful marriage with a good man. Now, she asks for these blessings, and she asks them to leave. But the women resist because they genuinely love their mother-in-law, Naomi. But she keeps on insisting. She keeps on arguing. And eventually... Orpah gets the point. She gives in, she kisses her mother-in-law goodbye, and she begins to leave, but Ruth refuses to. Now, Ruth is going to give the reasons why, but before we look at Ruth's beautiful response, let's take a moment and just settle and look at the other woman. Let's look at Orpah. Sometimes we can skip over her, but there are lessons to be learned from her. You see, Orpah was a committed woman. She was committed enough that she's already willing to leave Moab, her home country, and go with this aging mother-in-law, Naomi, wherever she might drag her. Orpah was committed to her. It took a lot of arguing and many tears to finally get Orpah to go home. She's clearly got great character. She's not put in a negative light in the scriptures. She is a good woman. She does what many of us would do in her commitment. In fact, if we're honest, I think she goes further than many of us would have gone in her commitment to her mother-in-law. But all the same, I want to suggest to you that leaving Naomi was certainly the greatest mistake of Orpah's life. Let me explain. See, we never read about Orpah again. You might say, how can you say that? You don't know what happened to her. You don't know how her story ends. But I think we can draw some real conclusions based on the blessing that Naomi prayed for her two daughters-in-law. See, Naomi wanted them to go back to Moab, where she felt that they could find committed love from a new husband and from God. No doubt, a wonderful woman like Orpah found a great husband. But what about God? You see, surely the most important part of Naomi's blessing was the blessing of God's love. And yet that's the very thing that she missed. The problem is she went the wrong way. She went to Moab. That's in the wrong direction to encounter God. You see, she's moving away from Naomi. That's the family that no doubt first introduced her to God. She's heading away from the promised land, away from the tabernacle, away from the people of God, and she's heading instead to Moab, a place where God is not worshipped, a place where God is not honored. Now, I don't care if she married the king of Moab, and he gave her everything she could have ever dreamed of and wanted. She still missed out because she missed, she missed the greatest thing. God. So what does the rest of it matter? See, all of this argument I'm saying is confirmed by what Naomi then argues to Ruth in the very next verse. She says to her, look at this, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. The move to Moab was the move away from God, to abandon God. And that is how Ruth, I mean, Orpah made a terrible mistake. And the real irony in all this is Orpah left God behind because she thought the good life was waiting in Moab. That's where she could have the family that she dreamed of. That's where her future seemed bright. And yet Ruth, who was willing to leave all that behind, to go with Naomi wherever she went, and in doing that, we have to understand, she was basically sacrificing any hope of being remarried, any hope of having a family, any hope of being around the familiar. And as she sacrificed that, as we're going to finish this story, we'll discover she gets all of that everything that Ruth, that Orpah left for, Ruth gets, and more than that, Ruth gets the committed love of God. See, we often think that we know the right way to find true joy in life, but it can be deceptive. Orpah went the wrong direction. I think Ruth and Orpah demonstrate what Jesus said very powerfully. 
so many years ago. It's a very challenging, challenging couple questions that he asks. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? See, I always think about this like, uh, let's make a deal. You know how they have door number one and door number two, and you get to see what's behind them? Well, Jesus reveals what's behind the different directions in life. Orpah's direction, Ruth's direction. See, a fear of missing out on what this world has to offer makes you follow in the same path as Orpah, makes you move away from God to whatever you think is better, whatever you think you can't get if you follow God, it's going to be better than following God. You're going to wind up the loser, just like Orpah did. Your story is basically going to come to a sad end. But if you give your all to God, as this verse says, kind of lose your life for his sake, you'll find it again. You'll find a life that's worth living here on earth, a life full of joy and peace from God. And more than that, you'll find eternal life in the life to come. Don't miss out. Commit yourself to God, even when other ways seem better, because they aren't better. The truth is, Naomi made some good arguments when you read it over. No wonder Orpah returned to Moab. Maybe in her place you would have done the same thing. Maybe I would have. But commitment, it's hard to keep. Even when other people are going the wrong way, you have to stay on the true way. You have to stay true to your commitment to God. And that is hard. It must have been hard for Ruth to watch her sister-in-law of like a decade, a woman she probably knew very, very well, walk away, heading back to her own country, her own people, her own culture, her own family, as Ruth still had the long trek to a strange new land. But she stayed committed to Naomi. And in verse 14, we read that as Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, Ruth clung to her. You know that word clung to her is the same word that we find in Genesis chapter 2, which is talking about marriage. If you'll remember, it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Hold fast and cling. They're the same word. They speak of an absolute dedication, a binding devotion to another person. Ruth has no intention of leaving her mother-in-law, Naomi. And in verse 15, when Naomi makes one final last ditch effort, to get Ruth to leave her. Naomi is doing this out of love. She really believes that Ruth's better future is away from her. Ruth gives an answer to that that is powerful, poetic, and sincere. I think it's also often misunderstood. We often misunderstand Naomi's, I mean, Ruth's main point. The reason is that when we give speeches, we're trained to give our main idea at the beginning and then at our conclusion at the ending. And when we read what Ruth says, when we read it that way, we start to think that Ruth's main idea is that she is committed to Naomi. But that would be a mistake. Because in Hebrew poetry, things work different. And make no mistake, this is a poetic answer that Naomi gives. And often the main idea is placed in the center, surrounded by mirroring points. And so Ruth's speech, when you break it down, is actually a series of five poetic couplets. It's the middle one that's actually the main point. See, the heart of Ruth's speech is not her dedication to Naomi, but her answer to what Naomi said. Go back to your people and to your God. And Ruth's answer is going to be, your people and your God are my people and my God. But before we get there, let's just start at the beginning. And let's look through this piece by piece. Ruth begins by saying, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. You see, all through Naomi's argument, we didn't read it today, we didn't have time, but all through Naomi's argument, she kept telling Ruth, return to Moab, return to your family, return to what you know. And she's emphasizing when she returns, what's waiting for her there. But Ruth flips it on its head. And instead, in returning, she emphasizes what she'll be leaving behind. If she returns, she won't be able to follow Naomi anymore. To show her seriousness in the mirroring couplet, the one that matches it at the end. See, she makes an oath to keep following Naomi even up 
to, and up to her very death. Only her death will release her from this oath. She says, may the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. You might think to yourself, what does do so to me and more also mean? It's a weird phrase, but Ruth didn't make that up. That was a common kind of oath that people would make at that time in Israel. The idea is that Ruth is telling God to hold her accountable to maintain this oath. And if she breaks it, that God would punish her. Now, Ruth, just like other Israelites, when they made this oath, they didn't say what the punishment should be. They left that up to God. But the general idea was not pleasant. They were talking about death, disease, or some other kind of tragedy that they were asking God to bring upon them if they didn't fulfill their oath. This is a very, very strong commitment that Ruth is making here. But I think I just want to pause for a sec just to appreciate what Ruth just did. You see, if you'll remember Naomi's been telling Ruth, you got to get away from me because God's hand is against me. It's not safe to be around me. God's out to get me. And, and Ruth now calls for God's hand to be against her, not if she gets away, but if she, I mean, if she stays, but only if she gets away. It's the absolute opposite. Naomi thought Ruth was in danger if she stayed, but Ruth is saying, no, the only danger I face, Naomi, is if I ever leave you. That's when God is against me. This is important. I want us to understand the importance of this because this means the same events that left Naomi feeling so bitter with God don't embitter Ruth. They don't make her faith waver. See, we're not going to look at it, but in verse 20, Naomi said, call me Mara, which meant bitter. And she said, basically, God has made me bitter like this. It's his fault. But she was wrong because Ruth experienced the same tragedies and yet it didn't embitter her. See, her faith didn't falter as a result of it. She knew that God allows difficulties in our lives, and she's fully prepared to follow him, not just through green pastures and still waters, but she's also prepared to follow him through the valley of the shadow of death. She's going to take the bad along with the good from the hand of God because she knows that God loves her, and he's never against his own despite what Naomi may think. Even the fact that this Moabite widow just made an oath in the name of the Lord is really significant, right? If you'll notice there, the word Lord is all caps. That means it's actually God's name, Yahweh, a name not to be used lightly. And Ruth does not use it lightly here. She calls this solemn oath, and she names her God. That is her God. And so, this is, uh, this is a, a statement of her commitment. And as Naomi experiencing these tragedies is, is running away from God, Ruth is running closer. She's running to God. This, brothers and sisters, is the kind of committed faith that we want. Not a faith that goes up and down with the rising and, and, and lowering tides of good and bad that life always brings us. We don't want a faith like that. We want a faith that's steady through the storm that sees past the external circumstances to a God that's behind them, a God that is worthy of our trust and devotion because he is devoted to us. If Ruth saw all this before the cross, how much more so should we after the cross? On this side of Calvary, can't we say with great conviction, along with the apostle Paul, I love this verse, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? See, we can say this when life is good and God is blessing us the way he, we want him to. But we can also say this when life is hard and God is allowing things in our lives that we don't want. We can be committed this way when we're not committed to the blessings of God but we're committed to the person of God. What I mean is the foundation of our hope is not what we get from God, but who God is. That's the key to a solid, committed faith like this. And that's got to be part of the faith of this Moabite widow who so many years ago had been through so much, and yet still she showed a remarkable commitment by committing herself in the name of the Lord. Now, the, the second set of couplets in this, Ruth swears 
her devotion to follow Naomi all the days of her life. She says, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. See, this covers Naomi's travels, where she's going to go, when she's going to stop. It covers all of her life, right? It's like if you say, I work through sunup and sundown. You mean you work all the time. In the same way by saying when she travels, when she stops, Naomi saying, I'm going to, Ruth is saying, I'm going to follow Naomi everywhere she goes. There's not a place that she can go that I won't be committed to be there with her. Her commitment doesn't have boundaries or borders. It covers every aspect of life. Do you see that? That's the kind of commitment that we need for God. Too often, we're quick to put him in a box, to keep him in a corner of our lives, to, to say, the commitment goes this far, but no further, Lord. You can be a Lord of this part, but not this part of my life. That's for me. We don't need, and God doesn't want, Christians who are committed on Sunday, but not every other day of the week. We don't need, and God doesn't want, Christians who are committed only in their home life, but at work or school, they're a different person. We need a commitment to God that covers our love lives, that covers our bank accounts, our friendships, our leisure time, everything. God doesn't want to be Lord of part. He wants to be Lord of all. Are you committed as holy to God as Ruth just committed herself to Naomi and her God? To forcefully make this point of how far Ruth is committed to her, the second cup couplet extends it from life and all of life to death itself. She says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Death and burial strike at the deepest chords in our lives. So this is a meaningful statement. You know, when my dad passed away, he insisted that we bury him next to my mother. See, it's a powerful, symbolic statement of a deep, abiding connection with another person in life. And Ruth here, she's describing that. And that's radical, if you think about it. Ruth is saying, don't bury me in the tombs back in Moab with my own family. Bury me with Naomi. That's where I want to be buried. She is, it represents her deep and abiding commitment to Naomi. Now think about this. This commitment goes beyond even Naomi's death, right? And, and this is remarkable because one of the greatest commitments in our life, marriage, that is just in this life, right? Romans 7 says that. It says, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. And this, of course, applies to men too. That's why when we do marriage ceremonies, the vows are till death do us part. Because when one of the spouses die, the other is released from that vow and they can remarry. That's fine. But Ruth doesn't release herself from that vow at Naomi's death. Naomi is an aging widow. Who knows how much long, longer she has? No one would have thought anything less of Ruth if she said, I'll be devoted to you until you pass. And the moment that Naomi passes away, she takes care of her to the very end. And then she returns to family. She returns to her own culture, her own country in Moab. No one would have thought less of her. But yeah, that's not what she does. Her devotion is a radical devotion that goes beyond Naomi's death. She's going to be buried in the same place. If you think about it, that's a stronger devotion than the devotion of marriage and the vows that we make to one another. This is a remarkable thing. I, I think, though, that we have to dig a little deeper here because we can just be so amazed by the raw power of this devotion, the huge commitment that she makes, that we can miss the daring of this devotion. But this is a risk-taking devotion that Ruth has to Naomi, I assure you. See, being properly buried is important for any of us, but we can misunderstand just how important that was in the ancient world. There was little that could dishonor a person worse than not receiving a proper burial. And if Ruth follows Naomi, she has absolutely no guarantee that she's going to receive a proper burial at her death. You see, Jews and Moabites, they didn't exactly get along. During this time, they'd been fighting wars. They weren't on friendly terms. They hated each other. And it would be like 
like if you were to live as a Jew, as a Moabite in Israel, you are certainly going to face prejudice. You're certainly going to face uh, discrimination, maybe even hate. And there are people that may not want you there, may not want to help you in any way. In fact, they may want to help you to leave. It would be like being a, a, a Russian living in Ukraine or a Jew living in Gaza. It would be an uncomfortable situation. Now, maybe while Naomi is alive, this aging wid widow might be able to shield Ruth from this a little bit, although that's quite frankly pretty doubtful. But after she dies, what are the chances that the people who just tolerated her presence for the sake of Naomi are going to be willing to bury this Moabite widow along with a good Jewish woman like Naomi? What are the chances of that? See, Ruth's commitment isn't just strong. It's taking massive risks as well. I mean, let's put it in another way. Think about how hard this is going to be on Ruth to move to Israel. She's leaving her own country, her own culture, her own native tongue to live in Israel, and that is no small thing. That's hard for us to do. If you've ever lived in another country, you know it's not easy. But how much more so in the ancient world? Because we live in a mobile society. It means nothing for us to move around. Many people will move around many times in their lives. I, I counted back, I've moved 18 times, lived in six different cities in three different countries already. And I'm not that old. But ancient people, like we, we move, just to give examples, we move for school, we move for work, we move for a better home, we move for uh, a change of scenery, we move. Ancient people didn't do this. It was not at all uncommon to be born and die in the very same village or city. And that was considered the good life. That might seem awful to us. That was considered the good life, right? To stay where your roots were, where your family was, where you were known and where you knew things among your own people. You know, we have a record of this ancient man who actually disinherited his two sons because they had the audacity to move to a neighboring village. He couldn't stand it, so he disinherited them. They just didn't do this. But you might say, wait a sec, Naomi has done this. But it cost her everything. She lost everything when she moved, right? And yet here is Ruth, and she's going to follow and move. She's leaving everything familiar, everything she's ever known, to move to a strange new land among a hostile people. It reminds me a little bit of Abraham. Do you remember God called Abraham to leave his own country and his own people and go where he would tell him to go? Abraham had great faith. I mean, he's the poster child of faith. He's the gold standard of faithfulness. And yet, he moved only after receiving a beautiful promise of blessing from God. Ruth has no such promise right? She didn't receive a promise directly from God here, and yet she's moving anyway. And think about this, when Abraham moved, he left with his spouse, with his family members, with his servants, with his possessions. Ruth is leaving empty-handed. What's she got? Just a poor widow. And Ruth is, she's going to a place where she doesn't really have a hope of remarriage, as far as she knows. She doesn't have family there, aside from Naomi. She doesn't have safety there. She doesn't have familiarity there. This is quite a risk. Ruth is literally throwing herself upon an uncertain future when she throws herself upon God. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you followed God into something really risky, something where you were very uncomfortable? Is it that he never leads any of us there? Or is it that we don't have risk-taking commitment to God like Ruth? See, we need to learn from this. We need to see this because we don't want to miss out. Our commitment to God should be there even when it takes all that you have. Ruth gave up everything. But in the end, she got it all back and more because this is how our God responds to this kind of commitment to him. A good measure of your commitment is to ask yourself, are you willing to take those risks? Because true commitment doesn't play it safe, right? If you're truly committed to someone, you follow them wherever they go, regardless of the risk. You don't count the cost. 
you love the person. That's what true commitment looks like. Don't show me your commitment by your blessings or your service alone. Show me your commitment by your risks. Are you having a risk-taking faith? For most of us, we don't have nearly enough of that, do we? But try God out in this. When he calls you to something risky, follow him. See where he leads you. You won't be disappointed. He's going to lead you to good places and great blessings, things you couldn't have imagined. We miss out sometimes because we're not willing to have a risk-taking commitment to God. But I assure you, he calls us to risky places. So let this poor widow from so many years ago, let her ferocious courage inspire you to follow after God with a risk-taking commitment. Now, finally, we've come to the center, the core of what um, Ruth said, her oath. It's her main point. As she said, your people shall be my people and your God, my God. See, this wasn't just an oath to stay with Naomi, even in death. It was an oath that led to radical change in her life. See, she changed her people group, she changed her religion, and that was the core of what she was doing. She did not need to change this in order to follow and stay with her mother-in-law. But that's not what's happening. She's not changing it for her mother-in-law. She's actually following her mother-in-law because she's changed this. That's the primary thing. That's the core. That's what leads to the radical change. She has decided to follow God. Now, this whole thing about changing her people group, this is not about ethnicity. This is about the lordship of Christ. We can get confused here, but we need to understand that Israelites were the people of God, and they were mostly descended from Abraham, but that was never exclusive. There were others who, who if they wanted to follow God, they could join into the people of God. It happened in Egypt when they first left slavery, and a mixed group of peoples went along with them. It happened at Jericho when first entering the promised land, and Rahab joined them. And it's now happening with Ruth as she's taken their Naomi's God as her own and become one of them. So you see, taking Naomi's people as her people is her statement that I am part of the people of God. I am God's. It's primarily about her faith. See, Naomi must have learned about the Lord over the 10 years that she was married into this family. She must have heard, I mean, Ruth must have known about the Lord the 10 years she was married into the family. She must have heard that he was the creator God, the one true God, and a loving, forgiving God with covenantal love. He brought the people of Egypt, the people out of Egypt in slavery, and he taught them the way of holiness. He wanted his people to be holy. And when they failed, and when they sinned, he didn't reject them. He didn't turn away from them. He didn't, he didn't just hate them. Instead, he provided a means of atonement for their sin. He forgave their sin and lovingly showed them a way to righteousness and forgiveness. See, this must have been so different from what Naomi knew in Moab, because there she probably worshiped the vile Moabite god Chemosh. This was not a god who loved his people and forgave them. This was a god that demanded sacrifice, sometimes human sacrifice, and when, if you bribed him with the sacrifice, only then would he ever bother to bless you. Very, very different thing. When she discovered the true God, he's loving, he is forgiving, he is saving. She said, I want this. I want this. This is so much better than anything that awaits me if I return to Moab. I want this God for myself. How about you? You've heard about God. Are you willing to commit yourself to him this way? God has already shown his commitment to you, and it's a remarkable commitment in sending Jesus to die for you and to save you. See, Jesus, in a committed love, he came down to become human and live the perfect life that we couldn't and was devoted to us even to the point of death on a cross. He didn't just live the life that we couldn't, he died the death we deserved as he took God's judgment for our sins upon himself and in exchange for our sins, he gave us his righteousness. Ruth, she promised that she would stay with Naomi for her whole life to the point of death. But after that, Ruth was powerless. There's nothing more she could do. But Jesus overcame death in resurrection. And he will never leave us 
or forsake us for all eternity. Ruth made an oath to this woman that she would do her best to fulfill. But Christ, when you accept salvation, he places his covenantal committed love upon you and there's nothing, nothing that you can do, no sin too terrible to stop him from loving you once you're saved. See, Ruth left her people behind to make him her God. What's stopping you? Don't take the path of Orpah. Don't be deceived by what you think might be apparently better blessings away from God. Take Christ as your Lord. Those paths, they don't lead to life. He is the Lord of life. He is the one who blesses. Commit your life and eternity to him. How do you do that? You repent of your sin, asking God to forgive you of it, confessing it, turning from it, and put your faith in his death and resurrection. Trust him with your sins on the cross. Trust him to be Lord of your life. Say a little bit like what Ruth said so many years ago. She said, oh, let me get back to it there. Oh, I missed it. She said, um, uh, where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. What's that mean? Make him the Lord of your life. Say to him, wherever you lead me, I will go. Do you remember the Israelites when they left slavery in Egypt? They followed the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Let God lead you. He led them all the way to the promised land. He'll lead you home to heaven with himself. And then keep saying with Ruth, your people are my people. You know, when you commit yourself to Christ, you commit yourself to the people of God too. You join into his family. He made you part of his people. And then you love the rest of them because if they were worthy enough for Christ to die for them, they are worthy of your love too. So serve your brothers and sisters joyfully with the gifts that God has given you. Forgive them. Don't hold grudges. It's not worth it. Bear with one another helping each other where help is needed, covering any offense or eccentricity with the love of Christ, may we be united as the people of God. And may we ever be open to more joining, no matter what their background may be. And finally, say along with Ruth, your God shall be my God. Take him as the Lord of your life. Don't miss out. Commit yourself to God. Even when other ways seem better, don't make the same mistake as Orpah, who tried to find the good life, but missed out on God and lost the truest and best blessing. And her story ended in darkness. Commit yourself to God, even when he takes, it takes all that you have, because whatever you give, you won't regret it any more than Ruth did. She will face hard times, we're going to read about those, but God will overflow her cup and blessing, and he'll do the same for you if you commit to him in this way. You know, just on Friday, I attended the funeral service of Mr. James Lee, a man who was deeply committed to God for his entire life. It was a beautiful service. He lived a full life, a good life, and I want us to see, if, if you knew him, many of us did, he didn't live less of a life for his commitment to God. Ask any of his children or grandchildren. He lived more of a life because of his commitment to God. His life and the saints like him who've passed before us and a wonderful, courageous woman like Ruth, their commitment calls us to a same kind of commitment to our God. And that's my call to you today. Live in an unbreakable, risk-taking, all-of-life-covering commitment to your Lord. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks. We praise you today because our commitment is possible because of Christ's commitment to the cross. We thank you for it. If anyone here doesn't know him as their Savior and Lord, we pray that you would work with their hearts and you'd bring them to a saving faith. Use us any way we can, we pray, O oh Lord. If anyone's been far from you, Lord, we pray that you would draw them back. It's never too late to get back on the right path. God, you are forgiving and you are gracious. We pray that they would do so. And for those of us who've been trying to follow, help us to set aside distractions, anything that would pull us away from you and commit ourselves more thoroughly and more wholly 
to you as our Lord and God. We praise you, God, that this is even possible for undeserving sinners like us. You've truly provided a wonderful future for us, not just here, but in eternity as well. May we rejoice in you and commit to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.